NTAI art has gone horribly wrong. Not for the self-proclaimed AI artists after their crypto scam went out of date, but for the artists or even for everyone. The people that don't even know about AI art, the civilians, the non-billionaire class people, things have taken quite an unhealthy turn. AI art has taken the creative world by a storm. And you know it's a generational and world-changing technology when your parents start to talk about it. You can have images generated by an AI to make you a digital painting, anime girls, or fashion design idea. You can have AI copy your friend's face and make fun of them doing funny dances, but that may all change quickly with what is happening recently in the legislation side of this AI technology. By the way, this is a completely separated topic from LLM or AGI regulation. They are kind of a different problem that is definitely for another day. So first and foremost, let's rewind time real quick. Last December, there was a pretty huge online protest against AI-generated art with two main focus. First, how can AI generate art so well? It was a panic based on online artists potentially losing their job, and this reaction may have devolved into a wave of hate towards AI-generated art, which is completely fair. Second, the problem most people have with AI is that their artworks are being taken and used to train these AI art generators without permission. So since protesting against AI technological development is pretty much impossible, the attention then shifts towards solving the second problem, how to protect their own artwork. There are a few straightforward solutions to this, and the most popular one is definitely banning the use of artist's work in training AI. And here's where Carla Ortiz comes in. She's an industry professional artist and has worked for brands like Disney. She's the key figure of leading this whole NTAR movement, including the promotion of the GoFundMe page, protecting artists from AI technologies. Let me quickly refresh on what they want again. First, update on data privacy laws. Second, ensure artists' intellectual property is respected and protected. Third, make AI companies to follow strict ethical rules. Fourth, establish creative labor unions and coalitions. And lastly, hold stability AI accountable. Where she's coming from is pretty understandable, but for these points to work, especially the second one, which is why I believe would solve the major problem artists have, some extremely hardcore data tracking would need to be implemented onto the internet. Fast forward to now, Ben Brooks of Stability AI, Dan Rao of Adobe, Jeffrey Harrison of Universal Music Group, and Carla Ortiz came together for a Senate hearing a few days ago. Diana Rao proposed regulation for anti-impersonation rights, which would probably resonate with Carla Ortiz and the majority of independent artists that support Carla want. Diana Rao also said that, We believe artists should be protected against this type of economic harm, and we propose Congress establish a new federal anti-impersonation right that would give artists a right to enforce against someone intentionally attempting to impersonate their style or likeness. Holding people accountable who misuse AI tools is a solution we believe goes to the heart of some of the issues our customers have. And this new right would help address that concern. Basically make copying an artist's art style illegal. And it is also worth noting that NT impersonation completely goes against the copyright law, where parody is basically impersonation, so I wonder how that will go. This meme probably sums up the best for the proposed NT impersonation law. In this tweet, the author says that Twitter artists will soon wake up in a world where this is a reality of posting art online and immediately lash out at everyone but themselves with zero self-awareness. So in each of the styles other than FNF and the author's style, it also says that media is not displayed, this work has been detected to have copyrighted style and is automatically removed, blah blah blah. I guess fan art can technically be made illegal too, thanks to these potentially abusable regulations being made in place. The future of empty creative art or corporate exclusive art may just become a reality very soon. But here comes the worst part. Adobe proposed yet another thing called C2PA metadata system. It is developed with the help from Microsoft and other megacorps. It is suggested to be used to track the origins of AI-generated media. And here's an official video demonstrating how it works. Someone takes a photo using a camera with C2PA running on it. Its provenance information, such as location, photographer, date, is captured and recorded. The photo is uploaded for processing and digitally signed by the publisher, asserting their claim to the photo. This is recorded too. The photo, its information and identity assertions are cryptographically sealed together into a tamper-evident manifest bound to the piece of content for its life. A consumer sees the photo in their social media feed and can now click on the content credentials icon to inspect the image. They can see all of the provenance information recorded on the manifest. They use this to validate their trust in the image. An edit needs to be made to the photo. A designer opens up the photo and makes their changes. They create a new manifest, declaring their changes in an additional set of assertions. This new manifest is recorded and digitally signed. It's added to the previous manifest, bound to the photo and sealed. A consumer sees this new photo in their social media feed 
but is not sure they can trust that the image is genuine. They see the content credentials icon and click to inspect. They can see all of the provenance information from the manifest at a glance or examine every historic manifest detail. They use this to establish their trust in the image. I hate to say this, but it's basically crypto without all the good things that crypto bros tell you about. Nothing is going to the moon and there is no proof of work. This basically only boosts the credibility of official corporate and government approved media. And if you don't include C2PA metadata in your content, it could be hidden or marked as potential disinformation to other users, making online content censorship a lot easier and the creation of a blacklist very convenient. And if you include it, well, of course, your privacy could be compromised. Why? What platforms and governments could mandate the use of C2PA and what info it must record, including potentially your personal identity? And obviously, all the media's edit history or whatsoever you have done to an image or a video would be recorded too. I saw people online discussing ways like screenshotting, but that wouldn't work as they have stated in a document that an invisible watermark will be added to the images and acts as an identifier. On top of that, there will be something like a centralized information repository to verify the history of a piece of media. So even if the metadata is somehow lost, they would be able to match the images or even the videos in the database and reattach them. And technically cropping could work too, but let's not argue about how we can bypass it since we wouldn't have to worry about this if this isn't applied in the first place. And they could also just make it more complicated to apply on edge cases too. On the other hand, in the official C2PA paper, they discussed the downsides of this technology about how it literally can ruin our lives. Companies or governments can use authenticity as an excuse to incorporate your real life identification into C2PA metadata, whether you are aware of it or not. Not only it would make doxing people so much easier, and the anonymity or pseudo anonymity on the internet will be completely lost. I can literally imagine filtering the internet with a specific C2PA metadata data that you generate and get all the information and images related to you. And if you don't comply to C2PA metadata, you might just lose access to your favorite social media or lose credibility for literally anything you post or um, <clears throat> credit system. A credit system for naughty internet users probably can become a thing. Imagine you get labeled as a misinformation spreader just because of that one edgy meme you made back in middle school, and now you cannot find any jobs because of that. Well, these are all hypothetical situations, but it can be pretty terrible, right? Psychologically, C2PA potentially has the effect of changing our perception of what's the source of this image to there is always a source of an image. This can be problematic because it is setting us up to destroy trust everything we see if they don't have any sources, and we would easily believe something that has a source, doesn't matter if the source is fake or not. It can be said that AI copyright concerns are just a perfect way to push C2PA and AI censorship tech on us. These companies really cooked C2PA up just to propose it the moment they get the chance, huh? If the copyright expansion push fails, there's definitely a chance for more rally on disinformation and online safety, supported by these companies. Here's a great existing example and how C2PA would screw people up even more. Earlier, we saw Steam flagging games for potentially using AI art, and they asked the developers to prove they own the right so all the images used to train the AI model. So in the world where indie game devs would not be able to use AI generated art, let's say tile textures, to increase the realism of their game because Steam doesn't allow that ethically, they need to have a real person to draw that or own all the images that was trained in the generator instead. Do you think indie devs would have the money to do both of that? Well, obviously not. AI generators have finally helped indie devs make in-game assets much easier so they can better express themselves creatively. But no, convenience is illegal. The devs have to go manually learn how to make, let's say, pixel art from existing artists, sometimes even using artist work as inspirations or templates. Does this whole situation sound any better? On the other hand, you can also see the underlying motives behind why Adobe proposed this regulation. They are extremely proud of their copyright-free AI generative model because they have trained it on their own stock image library. They even said that if any of the generated results from their AI generator is a copyright infringement, then they will cover all legal fees for the user. And that's how confident they are with their in-house image generator. So if this C2PA standard is accepted, all companies or people that are being forced to have an ethical standard when using generative models would then have to go to Adobe. Because their AI text-to-image model Firefly is trained on their own data, which would not infringe copyrights on any non-Adobe-owned image assets. 
Not to mention, open source models would become something unusable commercially, which basically removes all the startups from the competition for the mega corpse. That includes Mid Journey and Stable Diffusion, since they don't own any images themselves. This C2PA build would be so beneficial for Adobe because they have the current and probably the only existing AI model that is not trained on any copyrighted images, while being able to generate top tier quality. So it can be said that Adobe is taking advantage of the artist's dissatisfaction with the current state of AI generative art to get public support for something that is directly beneficial to them. I mean, that's fair game. Companies lobbying for what helps them is totally normal. The problem lies in that some people fail to realize what they are supporting, especially when backed by these mega corps. Things like this would eventually backfire the independent individuals, especially with how C2PA can be used differently from all other entities. And you know it's a dangerous bill when DARPA, aka US Department of Defense, took an interest in C2PA. As they become more uh, commonly used, what it's going to do is surface those bad actors. They're going to be easier to find because they're going to be the the folks that are perhaps avoiding using the uh, the content authenticity uh, approaches. So the wide scale adoption of C2PA so they can weed out bad actors from the internet just sounds perfectly like mass surveillance. Anyways, C2PA basically cripples our society's creativeness as a whole, give the government a convenient reason for mass surveillance, and mega corporations to increase the monopoly in image generation, increase the barrier of entry, and basically remove mid journey and stable diffusion from the company petition because of ethics and we're basically losing our privacy and money at the same time. So what's next? What's the solution if we reject C2PA? Well, if I have to be completely honest, I have no other alternative suggestions on the table to help artists protect their art from being digested by AI. However, rejecting C2PA will potentially save us from going into a very bad situation and reverse back to a less bad situation, which is basically where we started with last December. But bills and regulations like these definitely need to be implemented it a lot slower. We need more civil conversations around it and emotional, irrational, or unrealistic responses definitely do not help. I will also have to say that centralized disinformation control sounds like something completely counterintuitive. Asking the big brother what is true and what is not sounds a bit dystopian to me. So yeah, let me know what you think down in comments. And while we are on the topic of making art, it is the perfect segue into today's sponsor, Skillshare. If you want to get into these creative fields like illustrations, photography, or even digital digital art creation, Skillshare has amazing classes to help you develop those skills and find your creative outlet. I've actually been honing my Photoshop skills and with a dream of making cool graphics or even by cloud merch in the future, I've actually been learning from this class called Photoshop in depth, master all Photoshop's tools by Chad Newman. Their lessons gave me some incredible tips that I wish I knew, like how to properly use the slice tool in Photoshop. The lessons aren't that long either, so it wouldn't be a huge burden trying to finish up a huge huge chunk of lecture. You can easily plan your weekends to learn about the passion that you've always wanted to start too. And if these creative skills still don't really interest you, there are also a lot of amazing computer science related topics that Skillshare has. For instance, if you would like to get into the field of artificial intelligence or even machine learning, this class called the Deep Learning and Neural Networks with Python by Frank Kane provides you with a great foundation while it introduces you to both theory and coding side of the field. So whether you want to explore a new hobby, hobby, skill up your existing career, or even start your own creative business, Skillshare has classes to help you achieve your goals. What's even better is that the first 1000 people to click the link down in my description can also get one month free trial to experience their ad free and high quality classes. So start learning now before you forget. And thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. A big shout out to Andrew Laschelias, Chris Ledoux, Alex Shea, Alex Maries, Deegan, Migilim and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. Follow my Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.